Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you. We're going to just look at the Council of Nicaea. Um, I'm just going to read you a few facts. Um, before I do, um, I'd like you to see a few clips about the Council of Nicaea. Uh, this is from um, Inspiring Philosophy. He's a, he's, he does some brilliant videos, and uh, this is just a few minutes on his Council of Nicaea. Have a look at the whole video, the truth about the Council of Nicaea. It's a very, very, very good. But uh, just a few minutes, he busts some myths that have been going around uh, the internet. Different competing views of Christ. Then the Emperor Constantine assembled them all together to decide on one view of Christ. The Council of Nicaea. Before this occurred, there were several different competing views of Christ. Then the Emperor Constantine assembled them all together to decide on one view of Christ. They met for days, fighting and bickering, until finally the current view of Christianity won, and the divinity of Christ was declared. Then the new orthodox view used its power to stomp out and erase all other competing views of Christianity. <laughs> or so we're told. You know, I hear this story a lot from atheists, cults, Muslims, and several other non-Christian groups. They always give, give me this generic story to try to that the Council of Nicaea made up the divinity of Jesus and created a new version of Christianity. However, this is all I ever hear, this generic story. I never get any more details from skeptics, and there's a good reason why. Because when we study the details of what happened before, during, and after the council met, this fable is easily debunked, and we see that Christ's divinity was not made up at the council. So let's start with events that led up to the council. On February 24th, in 303 AD, the worst persecution of Christians began under the Emperor Diocletian, and lasted until Emperor Galerius finally issued a general edict of tolerance in 311 AD. Two years later, in 313 AD, with the Edict of Milan, the Emperor Constantine finally legalized Christianity and allowed its practice. Now, I want to stop here and make sure this point is clear. Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of the empire. He simply commanded official tolerance of Christianity. He did, however, outlaw Jews from studying Christian and gladiator shows, although they did persist until the 5th century. It wasn't until 380 AD, under the Emperor Theodosius, that Christianity was left as the only legal religion. Shortly after Christianity was made legal, a pastor from Alexandria named Arius began preaching the idea that Jesus was not God, but a created being. He gained the following and began disputing with Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria. So in 321 AD, a local council declared Arius a heretic. However, Arius just moved to Palestine, where he gained a larger following, and over the course of the next few years, the debate became so intense that it gained the attention of Emperor Constantine. Constantine, who had just unified the empire, didn't want anything that would threaten division. He saw the debate between the Christians and Arians as a threat to the stability of the empire, so he moved to settle it. He officially called the council in 325 AD. There were no Gnostics involved, there were no Ebonites involved, or any other groups, the council was called to settle disputes between Christians and Arians only. Most other heretical views of Christianity, like Gnosticism, had mostly died out by this point, and the majority of those professing to be Christians were Orthodox Christians. So there was not a wide variety of different views of the council. Although Constantine originally invited over 1,800 bishops from across the empire, only around 300 were able to attend. Most of them were from the east, with only about a dozen representing the west. Now, it should be remembered what happened to these men less than two decades ago. Most of them suffered through one of the greatest Christian persecutions of all time. Many of them faced brutal torture and imprisonment for their faith. So, despite the... So, you know, the, the idea that it was just purely political, um, they'd gone through uh, tremendous persecution, uh, these bishops, and many of them wanted to be faithful uh, to the Word of God. And when they met at the Council of Nicaea, they were trying to do theology. One or two, a couple of bishops were very politically minded. Uh, so that's the myth of the secularist historians and everybody else mythologic, mytho, doing mythological um, 
reflections on Nicaea. Uh, so let's just uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Were they inventing the deity of Jesus? And what about did they uh, decide which books were in and which books were out of the New Testament? And did they suppress all these Gnostic texts and burn them? Oh, this is so overstated. Um, at the Council of Nicaea, the, uh, the bishops that gathered together were trying to define the deity of Jesus. And they wanted to make sure they struck a balance that was in tune with scriptural teaching and what the apostles actually taught and what Jesus himself taught. Because the, the danger was emphasizing the deity at the expense of the humanity. Or perhaps going in the other direction, de-emphasizing the deity in order to uh, give emphasis to the humanity. And so the, uh, the theologians that gathered had to weigh the biblical <coughs> evidence and try to be fair to all the evidence at hand. So, you know, that's a, <coughs> excuse me, that's a very fair, um, that's a very, very fair uh, statement. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, no, it's a very fair statement that there was uh, there was obviously political stuff going on because Constantine wanted unity in the, in the empire. But if you read the primary source material of many of these bishops, they were very interested, and it was very important to them about theology. And it was theology that, that it, <coughs> sorry, it was theology that was at heart at the heart of what they were doing. Most of them. Um, let's hear what James White have to say about the Council of Nicaea concerning uh, Glenn Beck and his comments. Oh, the Council of Nicaea. If you don't know when else it happened. Blame it on the Council of Nicaea. That seems to be uh, the the operative mechanism uh, that people have have come up with. It <laughs> is uh, I have heard so many amazing things attributed to the Council of Nicaea. Remember, uh, you, you can't get the original video anymore because uh, Abdullah Al Andalusi pulled it down. But Abdullah and the guys over in London produced this video about how allegedly the books of the New Testament were chosen, especially the Gospels. Uh, and they, they talked about eyewitnesses that were actually from like 800 years later and stuff like that. It was, it was quite humorous, but how they locked all the, the, the candidates of the Gospels, all the different Gospels, into a room the next morning. Only the four canonical Gospels were left on the table. And all this really, really loony stuff. Well... It, again, it, if you want to blame something on Christianity, blame it on the Council of Nicaea. And that's what Glenn Beck does here. But again, in the process, he ends up engaging in uh, tremendous anachronism. And I think you all will recognize it. Let's, let's listen to, uh, to Glenn Beck uh, from his, uh, his radio program. I'm talking about the Council of Nicaea. And the Dead Sea Scrolls. I tell you, we almost need to put together a time capsule. I was talking about this yesterday with David Bartner the day before. That we need to put a time capsule almost together in our children. We need to teach them the eternal truths, and we also need to teach them the um, the divine truths of our founding documents and plant them deep inside of them so they can never, ever be rooted out. Because they may be the vessel that carries those. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you know what they are? Stu, do you know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are? Well, of course I do. No, come on. Uh, most people don't. I'm not, I've heard of them. I don't really know. You don't really know. Do you, yeah. you have no idea why they were there. Mm -hmm. Sarah, average person, doesn't know. Any idea? Take a guess of why the Dead Sea Scrolls are there. Something religious. Okay, good. 
<laughs> even though I've explained it on this program a couple of times, I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that even the people that work with me every day don't even listen. Well, there's, we were actually talking about American Idol last night. The guy won. It was unbelievable. So here's what happened. When Constantine decided he was going to uh, cobble together an army, um, he did the uh, Council of uh, Nicaea, right, Pat? Yeah, Council of Nicaea. Um, and what they did is they brought all of the religious figures uh, together, all the Christians, and then they said, okay, well, let's uh, put together the Apostles' Creed, and let's, you know, you guys do it. And so they brought all the religious scripture together, and that's when the Bible was first bound and everything else. And then they said, anybody that disagrees with this is a heretic, and off with their head. Well, that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. The Dead Sea Scrolls are are those scriptures that had at the time that they said they are destroying all of this truth. Whether it's truth or not is, is up to the individual, but that at that time, those people thought that this was something that needed to be preserved. And so they rolled up the scrolls, and they put them in clay pots, and they, they put them in the back of caves where no one could find them. They were hidden scripture because everything was being destroyed that disagreed with the Council of Nicaea and Constantine. That's what those things are. Our children must become our clay pots. Our children must be taught the things that we know to be true, those things that we know to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those things must be put into our clay pot, our children. They must also be put into us. But for those things to not disintegrate, we must be a clean vessel. We must be a, a clay pot that does not have something inside of it that is rotting. <laughs> That seemed like the only appropriate sound. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! You're kidding me! No, oh, you really hadn't God. heard that. To be kidding, I've never heard that. Oh, <laughs> oh, it was last week, you know. Was this? Is it possible the U.S. Constitution was in there as well? I bet you Constantine wrote all that. Up. <clears throat> well. I mean, Glenn Beck was just talking. I want to go back and, and walk through this, but um, I have a feeling, and Turret and Phantom Channels came to the same conclusion I did just now, um, I think what he's doing is he's confusing the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nagamati Library. Um, there are people who theorize, can't prove this, but there are people who theorize that long after the Council of Nicaea, uh, especially around the time that Athanasius wrote his 39th Festal letter with the canon uh, list in it, that, um, that the reason that the various Gnostic texts found at Nag Hammadi were hidden away at that time was because of some official book-burning jihad going on. Um, and I, I have a feeling he's probably heard that one someplace, which, again, is totally theoretical. Um, uh, you know, just be sort of go, well, you know, there might have been this, there might have been that, you put that together. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, just for Glenn Beck's edification, the Dead Sea Scrolls predate Christ. Um, <clears throat> they come from the century before Christ, so the Council of Nicaea is 325 AD, so we're about 400 years off uh, there, uh, Glenn. Um, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls are 400 years earlier, at least. I mean, there's old, older ones amongst the Qumran caves, but um, they're at least 400 years uh, prior to the Council of Nicaea and anything like that. But I told you, if you want to blame something on somebody, blame it on the Council of Nicaea. Uh, let, let me back this up a second. I'm, I'm playing this on something that's really not all that easy to back up on. Uh, but I, I wanted to go through just a couple of points here that he, that he made. Nicaea, right? 
<laughs> yeah, Council of Nicaea. Um, and what they did is they brought all of the re Actually, I need to back up just a little bit before that because he he was talking about why it happened. Yeah, Council of Nicaea. Um, and to uh, cobble together an army. Okay, so the council, the, the, he wants to cobble together an army. Now remember, this is Constantine, who in, in 312, at the back, uh, you know, <laughs> he takes Rome, he has an army. Okay, he's not wanting to cobble together an army. He already has an army. He's united the two halves of the Roman Empire. So he already has an army. So he's not trying to cobble anything together. Uh, there's evidence that he was concerned about the unity of the empire as a whole. And by 325, 12 years after the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity, uh, you know, stop persecution against Christianity, um, he saw that as a, as, a, as a hopeful means of helping to hold the Roman Empire together was to have a united Christendom. That's very important. But he wasn't trying to cobble together an army. Eighteen bishops, and uh, primarily from the east, the, the west was was not overly well represented uh, at the Council of Nicaea. So, it, and, and it was only Christian bishops, not all religious leaders, because there would have been all sorts of other religions represented in the Roman Empire at that time as well. Uh, so, not, not quite accurate. All the Christians, and then they said, "Okay, let's uh, put together the Apostles' Creed." Uh, no. The, uh, the Apostles' Creed comes before the Nicene Creed um, and uh, not after uh, the Nicene Creed. Let's, you know, you guys do it. And so they brought all the religious scripture together, and that's when the Bible was first bound. And No, that's, that's not when the Bible was first bound. I'm not sure what you mean by bound. I, I mean, uh, if uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus both come from the time of the Council of Nicaea, uh, then you, you might say that you, you have your first full Codex manuscripts that from that time. Whether there were those that existed before that, we, we don't know. Uh, certainly, given the Roman persecution, uh, there may have been that were destroyed. We, we just don't know. But it, I have a feeling, again, given that Mr. Beck is a Mormon, uh, that he might have in the back of his mind there the idea of the choosing of the canon, things like that, which, again, um, had absolutely nothing to do with the Council of Nicaea. Everything else. And then they said, anybody that disagrees with this is a heretic. And off with their head. No, um, out of uh, their bishopric, not off with their head. Um, no one was executed. Uh, the very few bishops that would not sign were deposed, uh, but they were, they were not executed. So it was not off with their head. Well, that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. No, because the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, had been buried in the Judean hillside about 400 years before this. The Dead Sea Scrolls are those scriptures that people had at the time that they said they are destroying all of this truth. What? Uh, actually, like again, I, I really think what he's, he's thinking of here or has heard about, but obviously haven't read any first-hand information on, uh, are the Nag Hammadi texts, the Gnostic uh, texts uh, that were discovered in uh, Nag Hammadi uh, contemporaneously, uh, discovery-wise, within a decade, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so, it's a, just a bunch of old stuff found in the desert, so Dead Sea Scrolls, Nagamati, yeah, you know, Oxyrhynchus, whatever, just sort of squish them all together and make some kind of odd, interesting commentary. Yeah, Glenn Beck, I don't think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> So that's uh, that was uh, James White on uh, Glenn Beck there. But it just shows you how people can put out stuff about the Council of Nicaea and haven't got a clue what they're talking about. Um, I'm just going to read a, a little snippet. This is on an article at Monish Monish Monagism Threshold. Um, Ancient Church History, Reverend Charles Biggs. Important Councils and Creeds of Christendom. Uh, and this is what it says about the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is the most widely accepted 
and use brief statement of the Christian faith. Many groups that do not have a tradition of using it in their services nevertheless are committed to the doctrine that it teaches such groups as Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans and Calvinists. Traditionally in the West the Apostle Creed is used at baptism then the Nicene Creed at the Eucharist. The East uses only the Nicene Creed. As the Apostles Creed was developed and drawn up the chief enemy was Gnosticism which denied that Jesus was truly man. The emphasis on, of the Creed reflects this concern however when the Nicene Creed was drawn up the chief enemy was Arianism, Arianism uh, which denies that, that Jesus was fully God. What is Arianism? Arius was a presbytery in Alexander, Egypt of early 300s. He taught that the Father in the beginning created the Son and that the Son in conjunction with the Father then proceeded to create the world. The result of this was to make the Son a created being and hence not God in any meaningful sense. But the closest things to it, Alexander the Bishop of Alexandria sent for Arius and questioned him. Arius did not recant from his position and was excommunicated by council and Egypt's, Egyptian bishops. The Iranian position has been revived in our own day by the Watchtower Society or Jehovah's Witnesses who hail Arius as a great witness to the truth. Emperor Constantine summoned a, a council of bishops in Nicaea in 325 and the bishops of the church repudiated Arius, produced the first draft of what is now called the Nicene Creed. Athanasius was the defender of orthodoxy in this period and that opposed Arius. He became Bishop of Alexandria after the death of Alexandria was a spoken sportsman for the full deity of Christ. So basically uh, the issue is one of theology. Um, now I want to show you this uh, this is on the TertullianProject.org and you've got the Council of Nicaea and the Bible. Uh, so it's on www.tertullian.org and look up the Council of Nicaea and the Bible. Um, here you can you can get the documents um, of um, of the council, uh, so you can't see the writing there. But um, anyhow, you can get the you can get the article on. Um, sorry, you can get the article uh, called the Council of Nicaea and the Bible on the Tertullian.org project. All right, if you type in www.tertullian.org the Council of Nicaea and the Bible and you can get primary source material where you can actually read the documents um, Eusebius, Theodorus, Socrates, uh, a guy called Socrates, uh, Athanasius uh, and many many other primary source material and it's well footnoted article with very scholarly information very very scholarly stuff uh, there and uh, that will give you uh, your primary source material in studying the subject rather than just listening <clears throat> to people on the internet actually go and study it yourself rather than hearing what people are saying bottom line is Constantine called the Council of Nicaea because there was a rift in the Empire between the Orthodox party and Arius's party they met together and it was sorted out theologically. They debated it and discussed it. The Orthodox Party won. Not because of political, but because of debate and discussion about what was biblical or not. After that, there was an ongoing battle between the Arians and the Orthodox Party. Arius was able to, uh, and some of his friends were able to manipulate high key people in, in the government and gain political power and uh, gave the Orthodox party a complete run for the money but Athanasius stuck to his guns and five times he was exiled but he came back and eventually the Orthodox party 
because of Athanasius' uh, stickability uh, and theological commitment, uh, won the day. So there was some politics involved, but to caricature it, that Constantine produced these new books and Constantine uh, forced the bishops to, to state what they stated is just not correct, all right? It's much more complex and very theologically motivated history that you need to realize. Those are my thoughts. All right, I'm going to close now and hope that was a blessing to you. And so, um, so take care, all right?